Jeff Perry, at 23, a motorcycle racer with an international reputation. Perry started riding at the age of eight when his father built him a miniature speedway bike, and on any Saturday night, young Perry could be seen riding the bike around Auckland's Western Spring Stadium between races. Influenced by his father, himself a world-class rider, Perry dreamed of one thing, racing motorbikes. At 16, he'd competed in his first race. He came fifth. His second race, he won. A fellow competitor asked him if he'd bought his school bag to take home the winnings. Before he was 19, he'd won his first race against international competition. His talent appeared unlimited. It wasn't long before offers of positions with works teams were made to him, and finally he accepted such an offer with Suzuki. I started riding motorbikes in 1966. The thing was I wasn't really allowed to race until I'd got my school certificate, which was about the only reason I think I ever got it, because just something I always wanted to do was just to race bikes. My father never pushed me into it. But of course, you know, you see a lot more than of racing than what you would if your father wasn't in it. While racing, Perry worked as an aircraft mechanic for Air New Zealand. There he met John Ormatz, who was later to become his mechanic. In the following years, Perry and Ormatz collected a good number of international titles. They competed and won in Australasia, Asia and the United States. <laughs> John, he's been my friend for about three or four years. And we met really because he's quite clever academically and I'm not, and we were going to design a, a record there and try and do 200 miles an hour in New Zealand. It's just like two guys that like playing rugby together or, or like going and riding a bike together. But he races them and I'm trying to work for him. We get on good and it's good to go away together because he's good company and he's, he's, he's just a good friend. I, you know, even if there was nothing, if we weren't racing, it would still be just the same as it is. He's a very, very modest guy. He doesn't take anything for granted. And when you do have a good win somewhere, He's just all smiles and doesn't really say too much, but you can tell he's really happy inside that he's... Because he's, he's, he's really achieved something to do it. Especially a long race, you know, you've, you've lasted yourself and your bike's lasted and you didn't try and do anything that you shouldn't have done and everything just went well and it's, it's not just winning the race, it's winning so many other things at the same time. And it's... He handles it all very well. It's, it's just good to be with him at times like that, because a lot of people, I'm sure, would get really carried away and start throwing their weight round and start ordering people around. You know, you know, it's not like that. Sometimes I think he goes a little bit too far the other way. You know, the, the humble Jeffrey. Mr. Perry, call Mr. Jane Perry. Yes, speaking. Mr. Perry, call Mr. Jane Perry. Yes. Hello. H how are you? What? What? You won? Oh, Jeff, it, it's marvellous. Oh, he, he came second. On May 5th, 1972, Jeff oh. married Janet Hendel. Eh? Jeff would ring his wife after each race, this time from Atlanta, Georgia. Really? Jan was unable to go overseas with him because she's a school teacher in Auckland. Love you. <laughs> Ta da. Oh. I didn't expect that. <laughs> oh, it's a fantastic. Oh. This is where Jeff scores A1, 10 out of 10. Like when he broke his ankle in Hong Kong, he flew down to Auckland and his ankle was broken in four places and his leg was just black. Yet he didn't complain. And it was so obvious he was suffering such intense pain at the time and it wasn't until the next day that he went into hospital just a funny perception that he's got. 
but he never talks about getting killed on the track and I don't think it does you any good to talk about it because if it happens, he's not going to know anything about it, it's the rest of us. But I'm sure he does worry about being killed, but it's not that as much as being maimed so that if he does live, he's going to be a cabbage. And I think that's really what he worries about. If there was no chance at all of there being a crash in motor racing, then I think about three or four people would turn up for the race. People, I don't think, like to see a guy going down the road, but, you know, it's one of those, like, the added interest. When you, your husband's out on the track, and you know a lot of the other people out there on the track, the last thing you want to see is an accident. It's the gamble that's there. You, you know, it won't happen to you. It's the gamble that you hope like crazy that's not going to happen to you. He is basically sort of aggressive. I think you have to be a bit aggressive to be in the racket, in the racing game. If you're pretty placid, but it's just not your game, you just won't get on. In the States, everyone's trying to knock everyone else off, cutting each other off and kicking front wheels away and all this sort of thing. And because, well, $20,000, you're bound to go a little crazy. I don't really look forward to doing the first laps at Daytona in the traffic because up to this year there's always been a big crash on the first corner. I tell you, I'd really hate if, like, if I was a woman, I'd really hate to be in Jan's position. Like, she knew that he was a racer when she married him, but I, I can understand that it it must be very hard for her to even see in a little bit about what makes him want to race. Before you marry a racer, you put a lot of thought into this, and it's something that you just must completely accept while you are married and while your husband is racing. Before a race, it's very important to me not to show that you, if you are nervous, well, not to show it. I want to be behind Jeff in, in every way. I want to work with him as his, his mate, as his lover, as, his, as a part of the working team, as part of that working complex. <laughs> this is WHFJ of Daytona Beach, Florida, bringing all you bike race fans out there the latest on the build-up on the world's greatest motorcycle race, the Daytona 200. 200 miles of the fastest and most furious racing you've ever seen. There's going to be some real big guns out there tomorrow, trying very, very hard to collect the world's highest prize money. The winner must take home at least 30,000 beautiful dollars. But whoever he is, he's going to have to work awful hard to get there. This year, the 200 has attracted superstars in the bike racing world. Riding for Suzuki is the three-time New Zealand champion, Jeff Perry. Perry did one lap, practiced this morning, and qualified third fastest. Starting in the number one position tomorrow is another Suzuki team rider, Paul Smart from England. On the Yamaha team is current world champion Eno Serenin from Finland. In the same team is Carl Carruthers from Australia. He's a past world champion. Along with Serenin and Carruthers will be the U.S. champions Kenny Roberts, Gary Fisher, and Don Castro. On the Kawasaki team, the qualifying second, fastest is Du Hamill. Also under the Kawasaki banner, we have Gary Nixon, Art Bowman, and Cliff Carroll. It's going to be some race tomorrow. Suzuki, Yamaha, Kawasaki, Honda, Harley-Davidson, Triumph, BSA, Norton, BMW. Who will win? All we know is the best riders in the world are here for the biggest prize money in the world, in the fastest race in the world, in front of the largest ever race crowd in the world. Last night I saw the most recent winner of an AMA championship event winning the Ontario California 250 miler last October. Alongside was the rider that took the pole position here a year ago from San Francisco, California, riding a Kawasaki number 30, Art Bauman, with an average speed of 100.758 miles an hour. In the number three position for the second straight year, qualifying third fastest, the four-time New Zealand champion from Auckland, New Zealand. On the team, Suzuki will be number 65, Jeff Perry. Starting in the number four position on a Kawasaki, the 
back of it. On lap 22, Jeff took the lead. Du Hamill and Bowman, both on Kawasaki's, had been leading, but they crashed when their bikes touched on a tight corner. Paul Smart for Suzuki had also held the lead, but he finally retired with ignition failure. The race had taken its toll. Many bikes had retired and a number had crashed. The fastest bikes were reaching speeds of 170 to 180 in the main straight, and the new chicane on the back of the track was producing problems for the very fast bikes. Many components of these incredibly powerful bikes had not been developed to the same extent as the motors. Tires and chains were failing fast. To win a race of this distance and high speed, a rider must be very calculating. He has to ride his bike to the absolute limit, but he must also make sure that he doesn't run out of gas, that his tires last, and that the incredible torque produced by these motors doesn't tear his chain to pieces. The previous year at Daytona, Jeff was leading the race. He had an 18-second lead. He was sure he was the winner, but his chain broke on the last lap and his high hopes of victory were dashed. Uh, I think people will tend to look at this eventually and think, you know, what an easy thing it is, but it's not. It's a very hard road to get to where you're going. Many chances to be taken to get there. And um, if you don't make it, you get nothing. If you do make it, you, the rewards are very satisfactory. But there's not to say that you'll get these and that they will automatically come. But this year it was looking as though the outcome could be different. Jeff was still leading the race when he pulled in for gas, briefly losing the lead, but he worked his way up through the field back into the number one position. Once again, his chances of success looked excellent, but he had learned the hard way. You're not a winner until you finally cross that line. bike was performing superbly. His tyres were in good shape, the chain was not overstretched and looked set to last the distance when the bike began to miss. He had come 9,000 miles to compete in a race he had tried for the past three years to win and a small component of the ignition system had failed and was irreplaceable. He was forced to retire gracefully. I got into the lead and it was missing badly. But the thing is it would miss, it would, it would you turn the throttle and it would come in with such a bang, you know, that it would make the back break. And I was getting a bit sort of silly to ride on. And then the guys passed me. You know, I came most disappointed and then pulled in because it just got so bad I couldn't ride it. Well, something you did, you know, but it still really pisses you off. Um, it's just that, you know, you're here for a whole week and the tension starts to get at you like, Monday's okay because you know that everything's new and it's and then lots of things have got to be done before the end of the week. Then qualifying comes and everything's starting to get a little bit edgy by then. And after qualifying, you know, it's got so many days to get tense. And it's all over, you know, and in two hours of heat and sweat. Wow. But I figure we'll come back one year and we're going to finish it. And when we finish it, we'll win it. So then we're going to be rich. <laughs> Which is, after all, what you're here for, isn't it? You know, to get the old dollars. Never mind. Arno Saarinen, the winner, $30,000 richer. Two months later, at Monza in Italy, in another race, he was killed.
they kind of seems to turn everybody on in that way. They like to drive cars around like maniacs and slide in and out of the water on the beach. You've got to have something to get your mind right off racing. I don't really think there's much harm putting the car in the sea because we didn't harm anybody. Although we harmed the property. We didn't pay for the property. So there was no harm done, was there? Just imagine this look good here. You can flash the picture of us disappearing to the sea and have this good quote, you see. Yes, we did feel bad about the car going to the sea, but in America, you must consume to keep the old productivity up. And if you don't work these things, the workers get no job. <laughs> and actually, we are socialists at heart, so... <laughs> Freedom to the worker! <laughs> We put a lot of thought into the farm before we bought it. We'd like our children brought up in a country atmosphere so that they can go hunting and fishing and swimming in the creek. This is the future for us, but I still don't think it will substitute Jeff's racing. He'll also have to have two or perhaps even three activities to take the place of this high-powered life that he's leading at the moment. At least 18 New Zealand residents are believed to have perished in the Pan Am jet airliner crash at Tahiti. The 18 were among the 24 passengers who boarded the 707 jet at Auckland International Airport. Three of the New Zealand passengers feared dead had been living in Auckland. They were the 23-year-old motorcycle champion Jeff Perry. I was very much impressed by something Bruce McLaren once said at the time that his best friend was killed in a car crash in Tasmania. He said, to do something well, to die trying, trying to do it better, cannot be foolhardy. It would be a waste of one's life to do nothing with one's ability. For life is measured in achievement and not in years lived alone. <laughs>